Learning about Salesforce integration is an important part of a lot of Salesforce professionals' roles. For developers, they'll find themselves working on integrations as a common part of their job. And for Salesforce admins, consultants, and architects, the word integration will commonly come up in projects. Hi, I'm Ben McCarthy, founder of SalesforceBen.com, and our mission is to help you advance your Salesforce career. Subscribe to our YouTube channel below and check out our extensive resources over at SalesforceBen.com. Before getting started, I'd like to give a massive shout out to Priscilla, who originally created the content for this video. Check it out in the description. Integration can invoke a number of different emotions. Excitement for some, nerve wracking for others, and bewilderment for a lot of people. But fear not, like anything in the world of Salesforce, there is plenty of free content to skill up and learn more about this important part of Salesforce implementations. In this video, we'll give you a complete overview of Salesforce integration. We'll talk about three of the main topics that you'll need to know before you embark on your first integration. This includes integration types, integration capabilities and integration patterns. So let's get things kicked off. Why do you need integration? So first off, why might you need integration in your Salesforce implementation or project? After all, can't Salesforce do everything? Well, Salesforce can do a lot. Sales, marketing, customer support, analytics, the list goes on. But no, it can't handle everything that a business needs. For example, it's very common to integrate a CRM system with your accounting system. This gives the business the ability to create invoices directly in the accounting system when an opportunity is closed one, for example. Another common integration is to integrate a company's proprietary system or website. Let's say DocuSign wants to automatically insert all their customers that signed up on their website into Salesforce, as well as usage information about how customers are using their product. This will require an integration. So to summarize, an integration is simply the process of bringing two or more systems together which allows you to streamline separate processes. And the backbone of any integration in the world is an API or application programming interface. This is a software intermediary that allows two applications to talk to each other. For example, when you use an app on your phone to send a message or send a cat-based meme to a friend, this will be using an API. Many systems such as Salesforce will have a set of standard APIs that allow you to connect to other systems using different different methods that we'll cover later on. But first, let's check out three integration architectures. There are three common ways to create an integration, and these are referred to as integration architectures. Each one has different characteristics, pros and cons. First up, point-to-point -point integration. Also known as one-to-one -one integration, this type of architecture sends a message to another system via a one-to-one -one relationship. Imagine you need to send a message from Salesforce to a billing system, to a shipping application, to a tracking system. Each system will require its own integration, so three in total, to ensure the whole process is complete. This could be considered the easiest way to integrate with other systems, but it does have its drawbacks. Firstly, it's expensive to build and maintain. If you need to replace one of the systems, you will need to build multiple new integrations to ensure it works as expected. Secondly, because integration logic is implemented in different systems, standardization and performance can become an issue. Next up, we have the hub and spoke architecture. This model addresses some of the issues with point-to-point -point architecture by routing all applications through a centralized hub. The hub is responsible for routing all traffic towards the correct application. Whilst this is an improvement on point-to-point -point architecture, it does allow for a single point of failure and can also cause performance issues if the hub is not properly configured. This is where our final integration architecture option comes in. The enterprise service bus architecture marks the evolution of the hub and spoke model. It contains an integration engine that allows you to create a connection between applications and other connected systems. If you're familiar with the Salesforce product MuleSoft, this is exactly how this product works. The ESB can perform routing, orchestration, transformation, and handle security. A key difference of the ESB to Hub and Spoke is that it completely decouples all integrated applications. This means there is not a single point of failure and the system is more scalable. Now you're an expert of integration architecture, 
let's jump over to something more specific, the integration capabilities of Salesforce. As Salesforce was one of the originators of cloud computing, they have long been a system that allows you to integrate. In fact, their first API was released back in 2004. This means that Salesforce has multiple APIs and features that allow you to integrate in different ways. But before jumping into integration capabilities, let's cover off a quick fire round, which tells you a bit more about integration knowledge. First up, like most things in life, timing is everything and APIs are no different. When talking about APIs, timing falls into two categories. You have synchronous calls. These allow you to make a call to another system, but you have to wait for the response before processing can continue. This will be required if the information being returned is essential to the process. You also have asynchronous calls. These are the opposite. They allow you to integrate with another system, but you don't have to wait for the response. For example, you can have a background job that is taking a long time to process as there are lots of records to send and you do not want to wait for the response to risk a timeout. The final bit of knowledge for our quick fire round is to consider the direction of the integration, which can be outbound or inbound, as this would, would depend on the integration that is being built out. To most easily work this out, ask yourself which system is the initiator. If the answer is Salesforce, then it will be an outbound call to another system from Salesforce. If the opposite is true, then the other system will be the initiator. We're armed with enough information to go into the next section, so let's cover some top ways you can integrate using the Salesforce platform. First up, the Salesforce REST API. This is an industry standard that is best for mobile or web applications. It allows you to integrate into Salesforce using data-based operations. For example, get to query a database, post to create a record, or put to update a record. REST has synchronous timing, so it's best when you need to receive a response on whether it was successful or not. The Salesforce SOAP API was commonly used by all the systems, but you still may come across it in legacy integrations. While SOAP is reliable and well-established, it tends to be slower and uses more bandwidth than the rest. So SOAP API is asynchronous. As you might have guessed by the name, the Salesforce bulk API can handle very high volumes of messages, up to 100 million records per rolling 24 hours. As I'm sure you might have guessed, the bulk API is asynchronous and allows you to process integration jobs in serial mode, which is one after the other, or in parallel mode, which is multiple batches at the same time. You've then got the streaming API. This is fantastic if you need near real-time integration between Salesforce and external systems. It allows for other systems to subscribe subscribe to an integration and monitor real-time changes of data in a system. Outbound messages have been a long-time favorite feature of Salesforce professionals due to the setup process being clicks and not code. It allows you to trigger a message to a SOAP-based server that contains Salesforce fields and their data. This can then be used in the receiving system for processing. This integration is asynchronous, but the integrated system will send back a message of acknowledgement. Web service callouts are used when Salesforce is calling out to another system with Salesforce being the initiator. For example, when a user updates an account's address field, Salesforce can call out to an address database to verify the new address. Salesforce Connect is a paid product and allows you to see external system data in Salesforce and is referred to as data virtualization. This means that you might have 1 million rows of data in an external counting system, but you can see this inside of Salesforce against the right record, but it's not actually stored in Salesforce. This can massively increase data storage and performance. As mentioned in the previous section, MuleSoft is a complete integration integration platform that Salesforce has in its suite of products. It's a paid platform that can bring together all your integrations, APIs, and systems. And finally, Heroku is another paid Salesforce product that is known as Platform as a Service, also known as PaaS. This is different from SaaS applications such as Salesforce as it provides the foundation to build your own business applications. Heroku Connect is a Heroku feature that allows you to integrate easily between Salesforce and the Heroku platform. Now that we're done with integration capabilities, let's take a look at integration patterns. So next time you're evaluating a Salesforce integration for a project, you'll have to pay attention to a few things to select the best option, such as type of integration, amount of data,
data, timing, and many other aspects. This will all come together to form which integration feature you will use alongside the integration pattern. The pattern simply means how the integration will work with another system. This is when you need to think about requirements such as timing, synchronous or asynchronous, direction, inbound or outbound, as well as the integration type that you're using. So here are the six most common patterns that Salesforce recommends, and you can check out more details using the link in the description. First up, remote call-in. This is used when data in Salesforce is created, retrieved, updated, or deleted by a remote system. For example, when a business uses an order system to update Salesforce with the order status. Next up, request and reply. Salesforce will invoke a process in a remote system and then wait for the completion of that process. For example, in the web callout mentioned previously, retrieving a verification of a billing address. This is of course synchronous. Next up, fire and forget. Salesforce invokes a remote system process but does not wait for completion. Instead, the remote system acknowledges the request and then hands off control back to Salesforce. Hence, firing, forgetting and resuming activities. This is exactly how outbound messages work. Batch data synchronization. If data Data stored in Salesforce is created or refreshed to reflect updates from external system, e.g. keeping everything in sync between two systems, then changes from Salesforce are also sent to an external system on a defined schedule. Updates in either direction are done in a batch manner. For example, you can extract customer activity information from Salesforce and import it into an on-premise data warehouse on a weekly basis. UI updates based on data changes is used if the Salesforce user interface needs to be updated as a result of changes to Salesforce data. For example, if a case manager needs to see a case status update that has been changed as a result of integration. Finally, data virtualization is when data is shown in Salesforce when required, but does not actually exist in Salesforce. Data virtualization came up earlier when we covered Salesforce Connect, but it can also be used for Apex, SOAP, or REST callout via a Visual Force page. And that's it. You're well on your way to becoming an expert on Salesforce integration. Although the word integration can strike a chill down anyone's spine, the concepts aren't too difficult to understand once you break them down. So whether you're a Salesforce admin, consultant, developer, or BA, these concepts benefit you massively in your career. Take care and remember to subscribe to the Salesforce Ben YouTube channel below, as well as visit our website at salesforceben.com to learn more.